Today we are focusing on some other security recommendations around other pieces of hardware from email, physical hardware and infrastructure, as well as some good processes and documentation that you can be putting in place around security. My name is Emilio, I work in the IT industry and I absolutely love it. And today we're gonna to be talking about security, specifically cyber security. Let's talk about some basic email protection security recommendations that you can be putting in place. Make sure that you've got proper backups in place for your emails. You've probably got servers out on your fleet. Uh, those getting backed up is great. Make sure that you get your email systems also backed up regularly. Whether you've got on-premise email, such as something like Exchange, get that backed up. But if you do have cloud-based email, such as the, you know, the G Suite, the Google Suite, or the Office 365 Suite up in the cloud, get backup systems in place to ensure the security of that software, the security of those emails. If they get lost, you can actually restore that email to wherever it may need to be. Get additional email filtration and protection systems in place for your email. Some of these email systems already have some basic filters already out of the box that can control what emails come in to your network. But put in further email filtration systems to improve on that um, email flow. That is imperative. Uh, emails can still come in, malicious emails can still come in. So you need a adequate enterprise grade email filtration system in between your email system and the internet to be able to scan those emails and block out emails that do not need to be coming into a network. Control and disable certain attachment types on emails. Attachments such as executable files. Files that can be double clicked from an attachment. Somebody may not even know what that attachment is if they double click on it and they introduce malicious software into your network. There is a broad list, there's a list of uh, you know up to 100 extensions, file extensions that you can block to control what comes in and out of your emails. You don't want to be able to allow any form of attachment to be able to be sent and received from emails. Any of these emails could contain malicious code, malicious software that could be detrimental into your network and your network health. Look at disabling URLs, you know, hyperlinks in emails themselves. Uh, if an email is sent with a link, somebody clicks on that link, you don't know where it's going. You know, it may say www.microsoft.com, but in the back end, it's actually going to some malicious website. You don't even know. Uh, so look at just disabling those, those hyperlinks altogether so that when they come in the email, it's just text. And somebody has to manually copy and paste that text into a uh, search bar in a browser if they need to access it. Because clicking it, you don't know where it could be going. And it's just a good security procedure practice to have in place. Let's think about hardware and infrastructure. These are good procedures you can be putting in place to improve your hardware security, your infrastructure security, and things such as your server rooms, your data centers, those sort of things. Secure your server room access, your comms cabinet access, your data center access. You don't want your servers, your switches, your network equipment just sitting in the corner of an office outside of any sort of protection. Anybody could just walk around get access to it, take things out, introduce things into your network you don't want. Have those in a cabinet. Have that cabinet locked. There's no point in having a door on there with a key if it's not locked. Make sure that that key is given only to the right people. If you have a server room, have that server room locked. If it's a data center, have the proper controls in place to access that data center. You can do this via keys, via scannable fobs, uh, make sure that the, the server physical infrastructure is not accessible by people who shouldn't be accessing it. Hardware that is end of life should be decommissioned. Hardware that is end of life is um, no longer under support. Parts often cannot be uh, you know, acquired from the vendor. So if you have parts that fail, you can no longer get it. As well as that, the hardware itself does have software loaded onto it, such as firmware, that can no longer be updated because the hardware vendor no longer you know, supplies that software for that hardware. So hardware that is now end of life should be replaced with hardware that is within life. Look at controlling your mobile devices. So let's talk about mobile phones and tablets, those sort of things. Um, if you want people to be able to use their own personal phone, 
to be able to install your email, your corporate company email, that's fine, but put proper controls in place to be able to manage and control that. Uh, further to that, you can actually have mobile device management, they're called MDM solutions in place to control your entire suite. Look at systems, you can actually put security you know, profiles directly into devices. You can remote wipe devices if they get stolen uh, you know, to lack from data from being breached out of your business, but look at controlling your mobile devices. Ensure that your hardware and your infrastructure assets are securely disposed. So often people just throw out old hardware, throw out, you know, throw out old desktops and laptops straight into the bin. They end up in landfill and anywhere from, from your office to that landfill and even in landfill, anybody can just get access to it. They could be sold off to wherever and they still contain your data on the hard drives. The hard drives will contain your data that you do not want to get breached out onto your out into the world. So put systems in place to securely wipe that data. You can, you can organize with third-party companies to do this. You can have shredders that can actually destroy the data adequately. Ensure that all of your assets, your hardware and your infrastructure is tracked and controlled through some sort of asset management system. You want to know where your hardware is at all times, who the hardware is allocated to, if it's physically in this building, in this building, in what size of the building, if it's located in a particular data center, uh, you want to have perhaps you know barcode system with your name on it, something that is easily trackable, that if I go and have a look at any piece of infrastructure, I can see a code on there, I can look up that code and I know exactly what that is, where it is, who it's located, uh, who, who it's assigned to as well. Across all of your hardware and infrastructure, get some sort of a legal notice to be displayed on the screen before somebody logs in. This could be your end user computers, this could be your servers, this could be you accessing a switch. As soon as somebody logs in, or at least turns it on, they're prompted with a security warning that says, you know, by using this system, you are agreeing to our acceptable use policy. Any breach of this will have X, Y consequences. Get that in place so that anybody who accesses any system, any infrastructure piece of system in your organization is well aware of the risk so that if they do breach any IT accessible use policy, they should have known better. Ensure that your hardware firmware is up to date as well. Uh, software is released frequently. Ensure that your hardware firmware is up to date. Underlying in most hardware, there is some sort of software running the, the hardware components themselves, get that hardware up to date with the latest versions of software and firmware. They will contain security fixes and updates, so making sure that your hardware is up to date from a firmware level is also very important. So there you've got an overview of hardware and infrastructure security recommendations. A lot of good foundational stuff that you can be putting in place. So apart from all of that, there's also a few good processes that you can be putting in place in your organization to ensure that things are running smoothly, to make sure that things are documented and understood in the event of disaster, in the event of data breaches, in the event of security risk. The first is the BCP, a business continuity plan. This is a document that outlines what happens to your business in the event of a disaster. What happens to HR? What happens to finance? What happens to your marketing department if a disaster was to happen? If your building is damaged, if it's flooded, if there's fire, if there's a cyber security risk, where do you meet? Does your business continue to operate at an alternate location? What do you do to be able to restore operations? You need to have a BCP. Along with the BCP is the DRP, the Disaster Recovery Plan. The DRP will focus primarily just on the technology component. It will work hand in hand with the BCP. It will focus on the IT systems, the backups, and what procedures you need to put in place to be able to restore operations. Who in your IT department is going to be involved? What third-party vendors, ISPs, you're gonna be working with to be able to restore your IT technical systems to fully functional operations. Many security breaches are actually initiated from your staff themselves. The stats are that up to 40% of security breaches are actually done from your, your staff themselves doing something by accident or even intentionally. Staff education is imperative. Whether this is staff trained internally, whether they're sent off site, whether if it's communicated by emails or internal meetings, get your staff trained up 
and aware of security concerns out in the IT and out in the business industries. So that was the last video in the series on security. I hope you found it helpful. We touched on a lot of different technologies, a lot of infrastructure. So I would recommend for you to go back and check out each of those four videos in the series on security. And I uh, hope you found it helpful and we'll see you next time. So if you found that video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel, Digital by Computing, just on the button there for more videos.